Mark chapter number 7. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 20. Let me set the stage here for you before we start reading. Jesus has just been ridiculed by the Pharisees, he and his disciples, because they were observing him, had him under the microscope, and they sat down to eat, and none of them had sat down and gone through the ritualistic washing of hands that the Pharisees thought that you should do. And you go and study it out, it doesn't say that they kept that tradition because it was of God. We know that Jesus filled the law. Right? He did nothing against the law. So when they said that he had done wrong, it wasn't wrong in God's eyes, it was wrong in their eyes. And you go and study it out, Jesus teaches that that was a tradition of their fathers. And that they kept that tradition to essentially lord it over other people. Right? Well, if, if Brother Ray didn't wash his hands or use nine gallons of the hand sanitizer back there before he shook my hand, he was unclean. Right? You say, that's silly. Well, there's still people that believe that around the world. In fact, not too many years ago, I heard the story of a... I, I can't remember if she was American, but a Caucasian young lady went and visited the Middle East, and she went to go get water out of the well that all of these other Islamic women got their water out of, and when she didn't cleanse herself in the ritualistic manner before she grabbed the ladle to draw out of the bucket... They said that she had not only tainted the ladle, the bucket, but also the whole well. And then they killed her. And you say, well, it's just a tradition. Some people take traditions very seriously. And Jesus did a little bit of preaching to the Pharisees and the crowd that was there that day, saying that it isn't in the washing of hands that makes you clean. Okay, then he gets back, he goes into the house. It says, uh, verse number 17, when he entered into the house... His disciples said, uh, what was you talking about there, Lord? And then in verse number 20, in the explanation that he gives to them, he says, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, covetousness wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. We'll stop there. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the opportunity to come to your house tonight. As Brother Christian uh, already mentioned, Lord, I do pray that you'd empty me yourself tonight. Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I pray that you'd help your people tonight with the uh, meager efforts of this uh, unworthy vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we've already said, Jesus, he goes on to talk about a whole bunch of other things besides just washing hands. He says, not only not washing hands, he says, it doesn't matter what enters into your mouth. He starts talking about uh, that in verse number 18 and 19. He says, the food doesn't even defile you because it goes down into the belly. And he says, where there's that thing, that draft, that cleanseth all things. Well, that, that's a stomach acid, right? If you can eat it, stomach acid is going to get rid of it, Right? Don't eat a nail. It's, that, it won't, that's not going to help you, right? Can't do that. But if it's food, the food isn't what defiles you. Right? Why else would Christ, you know, later on reveal in a vision to Peter the, of the golden fleece that all things that were created by God are meat to be eaten? Right? But if it would offend somebody to eat something, don't eat it in front of them. But if it doesn't, and they give it to you, eat and give God glory for it. Right? It's not the food that defiles. Right? It's not the ritualistic washing of hands that defiles. It is the inner man. Those things that come from the seat of emotion, as the Bible teaches, the heart. Those things are the things that are defile a man. And by way of introduction, first I want you to notice all the different categories of defilement, if you will. First, there are the thoughts or emotions. Now, in this long list of things that can defile. The first one, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. There are things that you'll think that you'd never do, but in the eyes of God who sees all, who knows all, you are defiled. Now, let's contrast that with another one of Jesus' teachings. Jesus said, if a man lusteth after a woman in his heart, he's already guilty of the sin of adultery. Right? He may not have committed that act to fruition, but in his heart, he already had. That man may have never done that act, but yet, Jesus said he was guilty of it. 
How many thoughts do we have that, oh, if I could, I would? Right? Anybody ever make you mad and just think, oh, I ought to? I may never do it. And let's be honest, in those situations, we don't do it because we're super spiritual and we think, oh man, the Lord wouldn't want me to do that. We don't do it because we have more faith that the police would find us than that God would deal with us about it. We're not fearful of God and that's why we don't do it. We're afraid the Christian's going to show up at our door, slap handcuffs on us. Right? Or, hmm, if this place didn't have security cameras, that's the least of your concerns. Right? We're talking about things that defile you before God. We're supposed to be a, you know, sanctified, holy vessel that God can get honor and glory from. We're not the one that does the using, but when He uses us, God gets glory from our life. Amen. That's what we desire for. That's what we endeavor for. Right. right? We often love that song that says, you know, we're drinking from our saucer because our cup's overflown. Well, you think God's really going to pour out blessings and handfuls of purpose on a vessel that He knows is defiled? Why would God let his goodness be tainted by something that tainted itself? The world didn't taint you. Our thoughts taint us. We may, may never act on it, but there are things that if we were to peel back, you know, the veil between our thoughts and everybody else's, we'd think, why, wow, that person really believes that? Right? But then there's also emotion. We can get into this list. It goes on to say, you know, proceed without evil thoughts. Right? And then adulteries, fornications, murder, theft, covetousness. Covetousness is not an outward thing. That is an inward thing. That's something that takes place in the heart. Amen. Right? I don't go out and steal my neighbor's boat. Right? I don't even. Yeah, we do have a neighbor that has a boat, but he keeps it in his garage and I don't see it all that often. Right? But I, I don't go out and steal the guy's boat because I want the boat. No, I just let that become a burr in my saddle and use it as an excuse for why I won't do the things that God does desire for me to do. I've defiled myself with expectations. I've defiled myself with goals that I've never stopped and asked God, well, Lord, is it your will for me to have it? If the answer is no, and I'm not defiled, it's not a problem. All right, Lord, I don't need it. Or Lord, if one day you'd bless me to have it, I'd love it, but I'm not going to let it hinder me right now. Right? Covetousness. Covetousness. <laughs> right? Deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye. Again, not an action. An evil eye, that's what's going on inside. The emotions that you keep, you know, if you're not like me and you can stop yourself from saying certain things, right? You may not say it, but there's a look in your eye that reveals what's really going on inside. Right? An eye that conveys everything that you don't want to say but you're still trying to say it Amen. right they do say that the eye is the gateway to the soul right the way that you do look at certain things you may look at some things and it's evident that you lust after it you may look at certain things and it's obvious that you disdain it you may look at certain people and it's pretty clear that you want to kill them Right? But those aren't words, those aren't actions. That's just an outward manifestation of what's bubbling up on the inside. Right? And then the list ends with, you know, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride. Pride isn't an outward thing. Pride will shape your outward actions. But pride's something that goes on inside. Right? Pride is the thing that defiles us because we assert we know better than God knows. Pride is my right to my claim to myself. Which is what? The essence of sin. Pride puffeth up. Right? And if you get puffed up enough, you're going to pop. Goeth before destruction. Haughty spirit before fall. Right? But there are other things that as a result of those, bitterness will defile you. Bitterness will cause you to, as Brother Sammy said it the best, Right? Bitterness is a poison that you feed yourself trying to kill your enemies. Bitterness does harm to you, but you're hoping that if you endure that harm, you'll cause more harm to somebody else. Tell me how that, as they in the 70 would say, jives with the rest of the Bible. 
Right? Tell me how that, with, you know, as Peter wrote, that after all these things work in you, right, what's the perfection of a child of God? Charity, love, compassion. Tell me how bitterness and charity can coexist. They can't. It defiles you. Right? All of these emotions, what they do is they stop up that inward man, and instead of being able to be filled with God, instead we are filled with those things that have polluted and bubbled up within us. Right? Because of pride, we won't let God reach down and clean us out of those things. But instead, we'll puff up and say, no, I can handle this, I'm just going through a mood. Well, I've had moods that have lasted a long time. Why? Because all of these thoughts, all of these emotions, by definition, they're momentary. But we can choose to dwell on them, even though we may not do it, even though we may not lash out at somebody else. Well, I mean, we're Baptists. We can put on the, we can put on the smile, put on the happy face, come into church. Hey, brother, how you doing today? On the inside, you're saying, man, I hate this guy. <laughs> you know what that is? You're defiled. You know why they called Thomas Didymus? Because he was double-hearted. He couldn't make up his mind. But he's following after Christ, but at the same time, Thomas wasn't there when he appeared to the, at that point, ten, because one had hung himself because he betrayed the Lord, and Thomas wasn't there. So there weren't eleven, there were ten. Why? Because he still wasn't sure. Show me where Thomas did anything great, where he got up and preached, and something great happened. Right? And I'm not casting stones. I'm just saying, where's the fruit that he surrendered himself to the Lord? Not saying he wasn't saved. He's going to have a throne in heaven. Right? He'll sit as one of them four and twenty elders. Or not. Twenty-four elders. But the point is those things on the inside, if they don't manifest in outward sins, outward iniquities, they will prevent you from doing what's right. And for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But the danger in being defiled is you get so caught up in looking at the things that are bothering you, you don't realize you're defiled. You don't even comprehend your duties or responsibilities unto God. You don't think at them throughout the day because you're thinking about these things that fill you up with all these emotions. But then, there are the things that defile that are actions. Right? Let's go back through the list. This, this is going to go over real well. I can tell you that right now. Right? Adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, blaspheme, foolishness. And what's the descriptor in verse number 23? All these evil things. These aren't just things that, well, if you do it the right way, you can do it spirit. No, no, no. There's blessing and cursing and everything, but some things are just evil. Right? The blessing is that when we have them, thought, Lord, help me, and then we don't do it. The blessing is that we see those things and we realize, but for the grace of God, there goeth I. But these are evil things. Why are they evil? Because in order to do any of these actions, you have to rebel against God. Not just disobedience. You can disobey and still stay at the Father's house. You'll have to suffer chastisement. But in order to do these things, you've got to be in a far country. You've left the Father's house. Physically, you may be here, but inwardly, you're not residing with the Lord. Because you cannot, we know we cannot serve two masters, but you cannot commit evil if your life is living inside of the hedge of God's grace and mercy. You've got to break that hedge in order to commit these things. But we know that all sin is evil. We don't live that way so much. We don't preach, you know, a lot of people don't preach that way anymore. But it's evil. You know why it's evil? Because it defiles what Christ did in your life. He cleansed you. Right? He took the darkest spot and made it white as snow. Amen. But we take that white patch. 
that thing that was pure and new and that new creature that He made us and we throw it back into the charcoal. Defilement is more than just, well, I, I didn't live the way that I should this week. Well, if you repented of it and got right, it's not a problem no more. By the grace of God, you'll do better tomorrow. Right? That's not defilement. Defilement is, I know that I'm not doing what God wants me to do, but I keep doing it anyway. I know I ought not think this way, but I'm going to dwell on it anyway. Those are the things that defile. Not coming in and sitting down and nodding and amen and shaking somebody's hand on the way out. Thank you for that. I, I really got to bless it the whole time you think, I can't get out of here quick enough. Right? It's not when you run into somebody at Kroger oh hey how you doing I've been praying for you this week and you lost a loved one inwardly you're saying I forgot all about that prayer request until I just saw that person those things which defy are not the outward it is the inward and again those things that are inward will become outward if you let them dwell there long enough if you let them grow and you know take root but it's not those things from the outside that defile you it's what's inside Right? In other words, back in the day, they didn't have modern day plumbing. They didn't have antibacterial soap. Right? They didn't have all the things that nowadays would get a store shut down if you didn't have them and tried to sell food. Right? Because it doesn't meet the health code. They didn't have that. It was good practice that you ought to wash your hands. Right? In fact, if you go and study it out, they would wash all the way up to the elbow before they would eat. And what they're saying is that person's filthy and live a life that's defiled. But Christ is saying, if you've got what you've got in front of you because of the grace of God, you give God the thanks for it, God's able to keep you from getting sick as long as you're not defiled on the inside. If you're living your life, it doesn't matter whether you ate bacon, which if they kept the law, they weren't allowed to eat. Right? Glad we're not under that no more. But it doesn't matter if you eat bacon or if you eat lamb. Right? That's not going to defile you. What will defile you are those thoughts on the inside. Well, that person didn't do this. That person didn't. They didn't do that the way that I thought that it should be done. Well, what's God got to say on the issue? And if God doesn't say, and it's up to each person's preference, you pray how you want to pray. doesn't bother me. I'm going to pray how I pray. Well, how do I pray? I pray the way that I've always done it, that God taught me to do it. Right? I didn't have this big, eloquent prayer when I got saved. I can tell you, the only thing I kept saying was, Lord, please save me. Lord, please save me. Right. And ever since then, I've just been talking to Him. Right. right? Well, that person didn't say this when they opened up the service in prayer. If God was all over it, who cares? Right. If God obviously didn't have a problem with it, why do I? Maybe it's because I'm defiled. Right? So what the Lord's up tonight, we're going to teach on. Undefiled unto His coming. Undefiled unto His coming. If you do something unto, that means you're doing it because. Right? We sang about first song night. It took them a while to get started. Right? But once I got in, got in the right groove, hold the fort for I am coming. If we believed it, we'd be undefiled. If we believed that the Lord could come back tonight, right, or that tomorrow could be the day that the church gets raptured out, we'd be undefiled. Amen. But see, unto means it doesn't matter what happens between now and then. I'm still going to remain undefiled. By the grace of God, I'm going to do my best to make sure it doesn't matter when He comes, but when He does, I'm going to be undefiled. From now until then. Why do you think the Apostle Paul said that he fought a good fight? And he knew that he could say it. Write it to a church and know that it wouldn't be blaspheme or a lie to those people. Because he said, every day I tried to remain undefiled. Yeah. You know what being undefiled does? It actually liberates you. You're free from the desires, the perversions, the lust of the flesh. And you are free to embark upon as a new man what Christ would have you do. Right. Remaining undefiled, sanctified unto God. 
right? Not only reserved for his use, but ready for his use. That frees you from all the worries that you used to have. That frees you from all the burdens that kept you bound. That keeps those chains from coming back and putting shackles on you. Because you know what being defiled does? It indentures you back to a lifestyle that you've already died out to. You cannot rejoin that which is dead to you. Right? You can never be a part of something that God brought you out of. You can try and get into the middle of it, but you'll never be able to be a part of it. Why? Because there's an inward man down there screaming out. Why do you think the Bible says that the Lord turned some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved? That part that had fellowship with God when you got saved, when we become defiled, when we defile ourselves and don't get it made right, it cries out to God, Lord, smite him down so I can get back into fellowship with you. Even our own soul lusteth after the righteousness of God. But when we become defiled, not only are we always rationalizing ourselves, because we know we're wrong, but we know that something ain't right, and instead of getting into the Word of God, well, I can figure this out. I can sort this out. It's just something on the job. It's just this. It's just that. Now, maybe it's a deeper problem. Maybe it's not an outward problem. Maybe it's an inward problem. Doesn't matter how bad the workplace is, if you're sold out to God, it won't defile you. Doesn't matter how the family treats you, if you're sold out to God, it won't defile you. Doesn't matter what they say, what they put on television, what they say on the radio. If you're sold out 100%, committed to God, it won't defile you. But the devil will use those things to tempt you to defile yourself. The devil knows. It, I'm, I don't know, right? I can't prove it. But I'm sure it eats the devil up that he can't do nothing to us to undo what Jesus did to us. But he does know that we can defile us. He can't defile us, but we can. Why do you think the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places? You know what all those things are? They can't touch us, but they can influence us. If we, like Lot did, behold Sodom and Gomorrah and pitch our tent in that direction, if we give it enough time, give it enough heed, it will take root on the inside, and then we're defiled. Why do you think that Lot's own son-in-laws didn't believe when he said, we got to get out of Dodge, because the Lord's going to destroy the city? Because he had defiled himself, and people look at him and say, that guy doesn't know God. Who are you to tell us what God wants, you, you know, wants us to do? No, I'm telling you, I just saw two angels that came into the house. They told us, we don't believe you, Lot. But he was defiled. Did God still save him out of that city? Yeah, God called him a righteous man, but he wasn't living righteously. Everything that God had done on the inside was hidden by the defilement that Lot had piled on top of it. Did God change his mind? No. Did God say, well, I gave, God, gave Lot righteousness, but I'm going to take it away. No. Lot changed. Amen. Right? When the Lord does something, He does it forever. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. Our salvation is not dependent upon us, but our testimony is. Amen. Our ability to be used of God is. Yeah. And we're talking about remaining undefiled unto the coming of Jesus living as if today might be the day that in the flesh I see him as he is Amen. now the first step on being undefiled unto his coming first we got to recognize what defilement looks like now we know what it results in we've already read that those are the things that you do after inwardly you become defiled. But you know what defilement really looks like? It looks like this. Could be from the Word of God. Could be from the Holy Spirit speaking to you, trying to direct your life. Could be man of God getting up and preaching. And really what defilement looks like is, mm, I don't know about that. I'm not certain of that. 
defilement is maybe. How long halt you between two opinions? Is God God? I know the answer to that. You don't have to answer me. Right? Is the pastor called of God to be the under-shepherd of the flock? Is the Word of God as true today as it was when it was penned? Then why does it matter what I think? Because I listen to me. You may not listen to me, but I listen to me. You may not listen to anybody else, but you listen to yourself. It is the inward man that we wrestle against. The old man and the new man are always at each other's throat trying to get the upper hand. That's why we take up our cross daily, follow the, the Lord. Why do you think the apostle said, I died daily? Because I was crucified in the flesh with him. Right? That's what the baptism represents, by the way. It has nothing to do with salvation, but it shows, no, we died out to sin like Christ did and were raised again in newness of life because of what he did on the cross. Amen. Well, see, Christ became our sin. He was not sin. He became our sin. God imputed his sin, our sins upon him. He became sin which knew no sin. Right? I know sin. This flesh is sin. It's cursed by sin. That's why I have to take my cross with me. Jesus didn't take his cross to heaven, but I got to take mine with me every day. Because the old man has to die every day. Amen. One day off of, well, I read, I read twice as much yesterday as I normally do for my morning devotion. Maybe, you know, running late, woke up late, instead of, you know, brushing my teeth in the car and, you know, for ladies putting on makeup in the rearview mirror. Instead of doing that, I'll just skip devotion and then, you know, I'll be able to get ready and then leave and still make it work on time. Well, if that opens up a little gap in the hedge, there's a way for the fox or the serpent or whatever can get into your hedge. If it can get past it, it'll spoil the vines. But defilement is not a all-encompassing, oh, that person just defiled themselves. Look at that mushroom cloud over there. It's a slow, it's a subtle thing. Why? Because your flesh knows if it makes too much of a commotion, you'll squash it. It doesn't want to upend your life overnight. It just wants to slowly change things to make it easier on the old man. And all the while, we defile the new man. You know what the cost of being defiled is? Defilement looks like, but just pull back a little. Because a little today is a lot tomorrow. The Lord is not an evil taskman. He doesn't lord over us and watch everything that we do and then strike us down with lightning bolts the second that we mess up. Right? He gives us enough rope to hang ourselves with because we are free moral agents. He doesn't want our praise unless it's given willingly. He doesn't want our efforts unless they're done out of love. He doesn't need any of us, but He desires us to love Him enough to do. But at the same time, if I don't, it's nobody's fault but my own. And the effects of defilement, essentially, you ever hear people talk about, well, it just seems like everything that I touch turns to ash. Everything that I touch, it always seems to go wrong. Well, if you're a Christian, I'd start asking, well, Lord, am I defiled? Because a defiled person, everything that they touch becomes defiled. A defiled person can do nothing except defiled things. Well, that thing that they did wasn't defiled, but it was done using a defiled vessel. God doesn't honor any defilement. What did God call it? Evil. Why? Because we have rejected what Christ wants us to be and usurped our own image of what we ought to be above what God wants us to be. That's pride. Right? That's rebellion. And what does the Bible say about rebellion? It's as the sin of witchcraft. We know what it looks like, but you know what it will eventually do? It's going to destroy everything in your life that you do. Because you're doing it without the sanction and without the unction of God behind it. You ever hear somebody, well, we may not know. Because right? 
I'm not God, you're not God. Man, look at on the outward appearance. But you ever just notice how some people, they can get up and they can preach exact same outline as somebody else, but God ain't within 100 miles of it. But somebody else, so you'd say, well, God can't use that person. They're just sold out to God, and the next thing you know, God walks in, people are throwing babies and swinging from chandeliers. Why'd that happen? Well, it's not because of this. You can preach out of the right Bible and God not be anywhere near it. You can pray something that's as true as the sky is blue, but that doesn't mean that God's going to be anywhere near it. God honors those things done by undefiled vessels. And without the honor of God in your life, without the blessings of God in your life, your life will be a destitute wasteland. You'll be saying, well, where's that green pasture? Where's that still waters that he's going to lead me by? Well, in order to find them, you've got to be led. You went a different direction. I'm, you know, there are people, even to this day, take them two little wire things and say that we can find water from where this is. You know where all that came from? The occult and a whole bunch of people trying to deceive other people out of money. But yet there are people today still claiming that it'll work. I'm good. I, I don't need your services. Why? Because people like that have made a reputation of being defiled. Well, why do you think some people will never, on their own, darken the door of churches? Because too many people have been defiled. Defilement starts here, but it has an impact around here. What does defilement look like? Dead churches. Right? People that don't understand the difference between coming to a place where God shows up and just going in your pajamas to some place that has a coffee bar and a donut bar, sitting there waving your hands for a little bit, hearing a guy get up and give a five-minute motivational speech, and then walking out and, hey, we'll be back next week. Right. You know why people don't know the difference? Because for a long time people have been defiled. It wasn't that God changed, it was that God's people changed. Right. Right. And when it defiles the house of God, I mean, you can go back, look at Ezekiel, look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, you'll find that it starts talking about they defiled the house of God. Look at how God treated those people. Spoiler warning, wasn't very pleasant. Destruction came, captivity came, bondage came, for some of them, death came. Why? Because they set aside God's standard for their life. And God's standard isn't all that much. It's just love Him supremely. Right. It's not hard when you realize how much He loved you. Amen. You know what defilement will lead to? Defilement will lead to pastor preaching on something, but on the inward part, man, I wish he'd move off of this. That's what defilement looks like. God forbid I mention the unholy Facebook. Half of y'all pulled back right there. Right? But if the preacher preaches on something and your inward thought is, why we got to hear this again? That's why. If he's preaching from God's book, and if he can give you chapter and verse on it, that's not his opinion. And when we pull back, and we say, well, I don't know about that, we're defiled. And we wonder why, after all the great meetings that we've had, revival hadn't happened. We wonder why that the outward community still looks the same after COVID as it did before COVID. We wonder why it hadn't got outside the doors. I'm glad those that have come, some got saved, some of them got help, some of them were prodigals and they haven't been. How come there aren't more? I know that the Lord's arms are not shortened where He cannot save. I know that it's His will that all should come to repentance. So why hasn't it happened? Is it because we might be defiled? I mean, don't get me wrong. I like preaching. I like preaching on tithing. You know why I like preaching on tithing? Because it reminds me that as low as I am, God blessed me with something. He didn't have to, but He did. And out of love and appreciation for what He did, I get to come in and say, Lord, here's my tithe plus an offering because I appreciate your kindness, your generosity, your love that you've shown to me. Not a, it's a joy to do. I like preaching on tithing. 
But there are some things we don't like preaching on. Right? We already mentioned one of them. Okay, here. Here's another one. This one's going to go over better than the last one. If you do something around the house of God, and you know in the back of your mind that the pastor wouldn't like it, defilement. Because you know what our pastor's standard is? Sirs, we would see Jesus. To God be the glory. If God says it, do it. But you know what the alternate of that? If God says not to do it, don't do it. If you do something around the house of God for you to get the glory for it, that's defilement. If you do something under the guise of, well, I want to see God do something, but everything's about you, defilement. Because I see where I'm supposed to decrease because he's got to increase. That can't happen if my ego's in the way. Right? If you take up a commitment to do something for God, but then somewhere down along the line, you stop doing it as unto Christ and you just do it to your set of approval, that's defilement. I'm supposed to do it as God would have done it. Now, I can't do that, but I can do my best and expect Him to do the rest. Right? And this doesn't happen, and since He's not here, I can say this. But Thad, great treasure. You know why Brother Thad's a great treasure? Because what the pastor says, that's what he does. Right? Every week he says, but I mean, and very transparent, y'all get the bulletins every Sunday. Every week in there, there's a little column that says, here's what we took in an offering, here's what it was in missions, here's what it was for the building fund, and then there's a category called benevolence. That's everything else that people did on top of tithing, and we just group it in there because we don't have enough room in the bulletin to list everything people give to. Right? But Brother Thad, I love him because the pastor comes in, he says, okay. And really, it's because Tammy's the one that has to cut the check anyway. But both of them, okay, whatever you want. But they're not back there counting and saying, well, okay, this much is going to go in here before the pastor can find out about it. This we're going to go put over here in the savings account not tell anybody about it so that we've got a rainy day fund. No, they just do what the pastor says. You know the people that God's used around here over the years that I can go back and say, that person's been used to God? You know the number one thing that they do? They love their pastor. Not just love him, but they love him because he's God's man and they do what God's man says. You want surefire blessings in your life? You can't do this if you're defiled. But treat the man of God right. Give to God and be involved in getting the gospel out. Can't do any of those things to defile. You can hand out a tract, but it doesn't mean that you're evangelizing the gospel. You can go and knock on somebody's door and invite them to church, but you can be as filthy as they are on the inside. If you have to worry about people finding out, good chance it's defiled. If all of your effort instead of doing is focused on trying to prevent somebody from finding out, God already knows. And you're going to stress yourself out. You may have grand expectations and ambitions, but if they're not of God's will and God's calling, you're defiling yourself. You're trying to live up to what you want to be, not what God wants you to be. The Bible talks about, you know, specifically, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, if a man desires the office, office of a bishop, that's a pastor, he desires a good thing. Right? I don't know why, Brother Randy, anybody desire to be a deacon, but if somebody wanted to do that, they desire a work of God, that's a good thing. But when our desire becomes more important than where God has us right now, doesn't mean that one day you won't be, but right now you're not. So don't get caught up on it. Right? doesn't matter what I want. What matters is, Lord, what do I need to be today so you can use me? Amen. Defilement gets in the way of that. Defilement looks like a bunch of people that claim to be Christ-like, but they don't live Christ-like. Finally, you want to know what will fix defilement? James summed it up pretty good in James chapter number 4. We like the first part of this, well, first part of verse number 8, but we're going to start reading verse number 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Oh, we like that one. Yeah, we, we can get the devil to leave. Now we can't, but God won't let him stay around when we get to the Father's house. 
Then verse number 8, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. We like that. Yeah, God will come to us as we're going to Him. He wants us to return just as much as we want to get back. But here's the part that people don't quote in verse number 8. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, he's not talking about the cleansing of the physical hands like with the Pharisees. He's saying, make sure you're undefiled. God didn't defile you. God won't undefile you. That's why it's called repentance. I've got to determine, I don't want that no more. I want Jesus. And we turn from it. You know how we cleanse our hands, purify our hearts? And what did we call Thomas earlier? Didymus, double-hearted. Well, here he says, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We know that God's God, but we also want to live like we don't really know that God's God. Or God's God on Sunday and Wednesday, but throughout the rest of the week, I'm going to do it according to how I think is best. That's a miserable life. Trying to appease two different masters, you get nowhere. You're digging one hole and putting all the dirt from that hole in this hole. Then you're taking this hole and taking all the dirt and putting it back in the first hole. You're making no progress. And all the while, God's saying, man, I wish I could do something in their life, but I can't. They're defiled. Defilement will not only cut you off from God's blessing, it'll cut you off from God's presence. It'll cut God out of your life. And I'd like to be able to stand and say, well, defilement leads to this, and then X marks the spot, you're there. No, defilement, that's something that you... God, why do you think the psalmist so many times says, Lord, search me. Show me the things that I don't know about myself. Lord, show me those things that I don't think are a problem because I put up with me all the time and I get used to it. Lord, show me those things that inhibit you from shining out. I mean, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, you know, neither do men light a candle and hide it under a bushel. Well, why would Christ light a candle in our heart to have us go out and shine as lights for Him if we're so defiled that the light can't get out? If the glass is so dirty, you can't see what's behind it, whether it's shining or not. You know how you get back to having the light? You've got to come back and say, Lord, cleanse me. Purify me. Stir up within me that pure conscience and help me get rid of this defilement. You want to know the word that over in Revelation chapter number 21, down at the end of the chapter, talk about New Jerusalem? It says of those that go into that city that they are undefiled. They're the sons of God. So if you can't enter into heaven with it, why do you want to hold on to it here? God gave me the thought, we're going to do it. You know what's a real easy way to defile yourself? Vote for somebody that publicly stands against things that God's against. You say, well, I didn't do it. No, but you ordained it. Why do you think that, you, know, you just don't go in blind? We're accountable for the deeds we did in the body. So if I vote for someone that's for killing babies, they may have never killed a baby. But if they allow others to continue to do it while they're in office, and I voted for them, I'm to blame. I'm defiled. Because I took a stand and said, for whatever reason, I want that person in office, even though I know what this is. It's also in the book of James that we find, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's at the end of chapter number four. All defilement can be broken. If you didn't know that it would defile you, God won't hold you accountable for that. Look at Noah. Noah didn't know that he was going to get drunk off of wine that was sitting on the shelf for six months in the ark. But afterwards he said, I'm never doing it again. You may not have known, but once you do know, you know better. And anything that stubs up on what God wants to do around here, it's defiled. You know why God will stamp Ichabod on the church? Because everything's so defiled that God says, I'm done with it. I've given them opportunity after opportunity. There's no one that says, you know, restore the old paths. 
get back to the way that God gave us. Instead, we'll do it on our terms and it's defiled before God. What do you think happened to Hophni and Phinehas? They defiled the things of God before God and God punished them for it. And then what happened to their father who knew better but allowed them to do it? Eli fell back in his chair and broke his neck. Well, Eli didn't do it, but he ordained it. He sanctioned it. And if you're the head of your house, or if you've got authority on the job and you know things are happening that shouldn't be, if you permit it, it defiles you. Well, I didn't do it. Aaron said, I didn't worship the false god Moses. No, but you made it for him. You were pressured into letting it happen. You knew better. Aaron saw all the things that God did before Pharaoh, just like Moses did. When Moses threw the staff down, it became a snake, and he picked it back up. Aaron saw it. He knew the power of God, but he feared people more, and it defiled him. He repented of it. That's why he wasn't one of the ones that was slain when Moses said, Who's on the Lord's side? But if he wouldn't have been, God had raised up another Aaron to be the priest over Israel. God doesn't need us, but we need him. Defilement cuts out the most important part of our life and replaces it with the most useless things that we could ever have. They fulfill self. And you know what fulfilling yourself will do? It'll destroy you. All the things that we like to do or desire to do that God's not a fan of, they cause harm to us. Maybe not physically, maybe not mentally, but definitely spiritually. And if you're dead spiritually, everything in your life's going to be dead. You're going to be standing on the outside looking in, wondering why you can't get in on it. Well, we got a revival meeting coming up. And I know, brother, he's probably already so geared up right now, he's, he's preaching in the basement right now when he gets home from church tonight, just trying to get all the thoughts that God's given him off of his heart. All right, he wound up, and he's in puppy dog glove because he got engaged. So there's no telling what's going to happen when he gets up here. But it's not the preacher. God could have sent the Lord Jesus Christ to preach to us himself. If we're defiled, we won't hear it just like the Pharisees didn't hear him. We won't hear it just like the crowd that cried, crucify him, crucify him, didn't hear it. Because they were defiled and they wanted to stay defiled. But part of you can want revival, but if part of you is defiled, that side's always going to win out. Because you know what defilement will do? It'll throw a wet blanket on whatever spark God does spark in your heart for revival. It'll throw a wet blanket on any compassion that you have for your fellow saints. It'll throw a wet blanket on anything that God desires for you to do. It'll quench it out. Because it knows that if you embrace God, defilement's going to go out the window. But let's all boil it down to this. If we were called up into the third heaven tonight, he said, come up hither, and we went. First off, would you go? But second, if you did go, would you first thought upon seeing him be, I wish I'd done things a whole lot different. Or could you go as Paul went? He said, there are days, I mean, he wrote, there are days that he would do those things that he knew that he ought not do, and there were days that he tried to do the things that he should do, and he didn't do them. He was always warring within himself, but he still said, I fought a good fight. You know what that means? When he saw him, when he got caught up, and, you know, Nero tried to kill him, and he thought, well, this would be the end of him. Well, his words are still speaking to this day. But when the axe or whatever it was fell, and Paul went to glory, he said, Lord, I finished my course just like you told me to. Right? Quit you like men, which is what we preached on not too long ago. Right? Don't give up until the fight's over. Battling for purity, for spiritual cleanliness, it's going to pay off. But the greatest thing is that if you, are, if you remain undefiled, God's just going to keep filling you with Himself. That's the greatest thing that we can have. Because one day I'll have him all the time. I'll be in his presence for all of eternity. 
Right? There won't be a time that I'll be somewhere that he isn't. But here, I don't get to see him. Can't audibly hear him. I know that he sealed me. He indwells me. But when I'm undefiled, he just shows out. And he's there with me all the time. It's almost like he's riding in the car with me. Like everywhere I go, he's just putting more thoughts in my head, saying, hey, you think about this lately? And then when I do start thinking about it, it, you know, kicking car doors out, right? Having to shut the door in the office because I'm sitting back there bawling like a baby just thinking about how good God's been. That don't happen if I'm defiled. Those things done in here don't get out the walls if the people that are supposed to carry it out are defiled. Right, so as Sister Renee comes, Brother Ray comes to get a song. I don't know what's going on. The Lord does. And we taught in Sunday school not too long ago, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, just gives to all men liberally. If you desire to know, Lord, what's keeping me from being where I need to be? If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.